You're listening to an Anna's Owl Ministries podcast. Can a soulless money grab still inspire a good conversation? Would you brave the unknown for a pardon? What are the newest change-ups in the Pokemon card scene? Is the newest adaptation of Trigon worth your time? What are the newest video games coming out soon that we're really hyped about? And finally, what is TJ's second, second secret thing that he refused to disclose to us before we recorded? And will it live up to the hype? Or will we all roll our eyes in disdain? All these topics and more are what we're going to be discussing today on today's episode of What's News. Guys, we are Systematic Geekology. We are the priests to the geeks. I'm your host, Christian Ashley. I am joined today by, of course, the best co-host in all of creation. Throughout time and space, wherever you go, he's always going to be there, hyping you up, TJ Blackwell. Thank you. We are also joined today by our special friend, James. How are you doing today? Great. Hope everyone's doing well. Awesome. So, guys, as we always do with these, we're going to start with a quick lightning round. Uh, some of the stuff that we we want to talk about, we don't really want to focus on. I'm going to be bringing up the Bad Batch finale. First of all, I think, TJ, you're still behind. James, where are you at with your watch? I have not started season two yet. I, it slipped for me. Okay. But I'm, I've been spoiled on some stuff, so go for it. Okay. So, suffice to say, I am way more hyped about this than I was in the middle of the season, where things were getting a little too fillery for their own good. But we started focusing more on characters. We started focusing more on the plot. And the finale gave me some hope for the future and gave, left us with some nice, nice questions as well, as well as some heartache along the way. I really enjoyed it. Guys, check out The Bad Batch if you haven't. Anyone else? Yes. Yeah. Um, the Outer World Spacer's Choice Editions just came out. Uh, if you never get around to playing the first one, definitely, definitely buy it. Play the game. It's good. It's fun. And what did they change about it? I know they increased the level cap. Yeah, so they increased the level cap, uh, all the DLCs included. And I think it, other than that, it's just like little bug fixes and things. Which nice. needed. Uh, mine is uh, just another Star Wars thing. Um, if you haven't watched Star Wars Rebels, now is the time to binge Star Wars Rebels. Uh-huh. Um, it's based on some recent uh, cameos and Easter eggs in this season of The Mandalorian. I've not watched today's episode yet. Um, but uh, now's the time. Suffice to say, now's the time. I, If you need any endorsement, um, I drug my fiance through uh, Rebels in about uh, two weeks. She was not willing. Uh, <laughs> he uh, likes Star Wars, but hadn't seen uh, them all until we started dating years and years ago. Um, and by the end, she felt all the feelings uh, there were tears. Uh, there were happy tears. There were sad tears. There was great anticipation for Ahsoka. So now is the time uh, to binge uh, Rebels. Well put. Yeah, guys, if you haven't watched Rebels, watch Rebels. Yeah, seriously, watch it. <laughs> A little outside of our usual wheelhouse, but rumor has it that Taylor Swift will be releasing a single of Taylor's version from each of the four albums that do not yet have a Taylor's version. Mm. Well, you never get know what you're going to get in the lightning round. Because I was blown away by that. You know what? Go for it. You can do whatever you want here, TJ. Let's see. Last on my list that I can recall, at least, uh, the Mandalorian. I have watched the most recent episode, but I will say nothing for the sake of our friends here. But suffice to say, once again, it has been tremendously fun. Uh, just Din and Bo and even Grogu as well going through some f- tremendous character arcs right now as far as who they are as people, who they are as Mandalorians. I'm really loving it. We're getting a lot of intrigue here on the New Republic side, on the Imperial side, and I am in it to win it. All right. So we're getting to our main topics of discussion today. So I'm going to bring up something that I watched so you don't have to, and that is Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey. Now, if you guys don't know what this is, (laughs) recently what happened is that parts of the Winnie the Pooh uh, let's see, I'll just say canon for the sake of it, have fallen into the public domain. And what occurred, is, as often happens when these things do, is that someone decided, well, I'm going to make some money off of it because it just came out of public domain. I have to pay the original authors. And they decided to make a horror film that, you know, when I first heard it saying, this could work. Uh, Suffice to say, no, it doesn't. I, this is one of the, uh, I used the word soulless before. Yeah, this is a very soulless film that outside of one moment when a certain character speaks for the first time, I really despise. It involves Christopher Robin uh, at one point in time being a child, raising these little weird uh, 
like half people, half animal beings is how they're referred to in the film. And along the way, he goes off to college and they starve when he's gone and they have to devolve into cannibalistic killers in this. And it is quite the ride, not worth it, in my opinion. But yeah, that, that's what it is. So I watched it so you don't have to. But we're going to discuss other things. because I, I believe my co-hosts have not watched this film and they're better off for it. So the only reason, like I said, that this film exists is because Winnie the Pooh has entered the public domain. Now, what are our opinions about how the public domain has been handled within the U.S. and what do we think needs to change, if at all? I think the public domain t- length, time length should be shorter, significantly shorter. How short in your opinion? Like maybe 50 years. Okay. Which would put Star Wars would put Star Wars almost in uh, public domain if they hadn't continued after A New Hope. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's true. Um, So for me, I wish there was some um, sort of uh, authoritative apparatus that could uh, evaluate um, uh, pieces of media that enter into the public domain to sort of stop some craziness happening, like making a Winnie the Pooh blood and money. I mean, it's just such a cash grab, right? Like absolutely off the childhood thing um, to get purely to get money. And you're sort of inherently tearing down the, the soul of the original thing, the author's intent. Right. So like we do this sort of with, with scripture, scripture is a, mm. a good um, analog here because everyone can read scripture. You can do whatever you want with scripture, but yet we still have these places we return to, to sort of like, learn what the original intent of the thing is. And so um, maybe that's systematic ecology or, or places like that where people who have uh, loved these franchises and canons, we are to think of Winnie the Pooh, Winnie the Pooh as, as a canon. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is. Um, uh, places we can return to to sort of uh, dispel some of the craziness. Yeah. I want. I mean, I watched the trailer for this. I don't do horror. Um, first of all, I'm a I'm a coward. So if you're a coward, <laughs> I feel you. You are you are valid and strong, and it's okay. And uh, yeah, I couldn't get through the trailer just because, like, uh, not that it was like the trailer was overwhelmingly scary, just because like these characters that I had loved um, from the time of you know six or seven years old or however old I started reading Winnie the Pooh, like. Or watching those movies. I remember going to see the Tigger movie mm. with my mom because Tigger was her favorite. Anyways, I couldn't get through it because it was just such a disgrace. <laughs> <laughs> and, like, and, and I'm coming off as very negative on this film. Uh, spoilers, my review is that I'm going to be like a, a one out of ten. And yeah. it's something that could work if you did it well. I'm not opposed to the idea but it's so obvious, like, oh, it's in a public domain. I have no one to pay for this script except for the writer of that script. So we're just going to send it out as soon as possible and make all the money we can off of this, which unfortunately is what some parts of horror have become these days. Uh, you make the, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, the cheapest scripts possible, and you're guaranteed at least on opening day like seven, ten million $10 million. And it just keeps making money, so people keep doing it. So that's where I'm at with that. As far as public domain is concerned, I'm with TJ, but I'm a little more strict. I am author's death plus 25 years, and then it becomes public domain. Because in my opinion, that's plenty of time to settle the estate. That's plenty of time for uh, wives and children and so on and so forth to make enough money off of it. And then after that, it needs to be given to the people, and they can use it for good or ill. Yeah, A big uh, – a, a different discussion around this um, that is – probably out of our wheelhouse, but is the, the issue in rap music right now over samples. Hmm. Um, so artists want to do some really creative things um, with samples in their music and, you know, other artists block because they have rights to those samples. And so it stops artists from being able to use them. I was just uh, this weekend, I just went to uh, the Dreamville Festival in Raleigh. I must have heard about this. I was very fortunate. It was awesome. So this is a big rap music festival based on J. Cole. And he literally was on stage calling out Kanye West. And he's like, I'm trying to release this thing. I'm trying to get it to the people. You won't clear this one sample. And so now everyone has to like black, you know, market, find it on the internet. And we can't put it on Spotify. So yeah, it, it public domain is, is good. Um, when it, I feel like allows creativity, it gets wonky when you just take something and, 
and run off in a completely opposite direction. And I feel like an, another comparison here is Kingdom Hearts, mm. right? Um, you, the only other uh, Winnie the Pooh uh, <laughs> adaptation I have seen is within that, and it's been throughout several of the games. I love it, but like that adaptation feels within the spirit of the thing. Yes, it's um, well, even with Kingdom Hearts too, uh, we have rights issues with Tarzan, and that he's no longer been able to appear since the first game. Right, and, and I felt like Edgar Rice Burroughs has been dead for years. Right. And I feel like that story in Kingdom Hearts 1 was within the sort of spirit of... Yes. I felt like it was a faithful adaptation. So it's it's interesting when... Uh, how long do we hold on to rights? When do we stop creativity? But how do we also sort of maybe maintain the <laughs> underlying spirit of the thing? <laughs> yeah. What's our hermeneutic of... of <laughs> yeah. I, so, guys, we kind of brought it up before, but, like, what is it about children's stories that make people want to pervert them and make them darker and edgier? I mean, is it possible for this to be a good thing at all? No. <laughs> a stunning repartee there. Anything further, TJ? No. <laughs> James? Um, I, m- maybe. I think, for me, I would want to consider the genre the original genre of the thing. So like if you if you think about genre studies, like Winnie the Pooh, for instance, is a comedy. There's a happy ending. Like there's a, a good resolution. There doesn't mean there can't be ups and downs along the way. Um, but I think if you twist the genre, like bend it out of place, it becomes something else entirely, even though it's using the same characters. So I, I think like adding intrigue um, and some sort of darker narrative elements can like still help you arrive at that end and maybe in a more satisfying way even. Um, but if you flip it on its head, then I don't know if we're dealing with the same thing at all. <laughs> yep. I mean, even for as silly as this example is Winnie the Pooh, uh, they, it's not averse to having horror elements in it. If you watch uh, the search for Christopher Robin or quest for Christopher Robin, whichever it is, like the whole yeah. scenario where they're imagining what could have happened to him and their quest to find him and rescue him from Skull, which is actually school, as you find along the way. I mean, there are, very, there are horror elements within that. So it can work within the canon to do something like that. But as far as uh, the question I posed, I, I think about all the times those terrible fan theories of how, you know, uh, let's say – uh, Ash died in the first episode of Pokemon. No, he didn't die. He was put on life support. And uh, this whole thing is his wild dream about how he kept going. And that's why he never ages. And uh, all these terrible fan theories to just like, why do you have to change something that is just inherently good and wholesome for that? And I think it's just because people are too jaded for our own good. Yeah. But I mean, in examples I brought up here, because I had to write them down because my memory kind of sucks. Uh, I bring up two examples. So Ultraman Nexus is something I can think of as a huge Ultraman fan. Ultraman is obviously intended primary audience for kids, even though there are elements within it that are more adult. At the end of the day, it can go into this different genre. This is darker and edgier done right. It shows how people would respond Ultraman Nexus specifically to this being that just came out of nowhere and starts, uh, attacking these other giant kaiju it's like well how do you know he's on our side how do you know he's actually working with us can we actually trust this figure you don't get that question a lot in ultraman series it does happen occasionally but it's it's stark and edgy are done right and of course another example i can give is battlestar galactica so guys who are more familiar with the series from the 03 and 04 you may think battlestar galactica how was that ever for kids oh, watch the 78 show and then watch galactica 1980 and they go oh my gosh these things are like night and day but it's done in a way that's true to the core of the original series while also creating darker elements for a more adult audience. You guys have any other examples you can think of stuff like that before I move on to the poor adapt- adaptations, in my opinion? Mm, not really. Um, but the Clone Wars kind of does a really good job of aging its themes with the audience. Yeah, comparing As seasons, season like seasons one and two are a little softer. Yeah. yeah, I think it does a really good job. James, do you have anything? Yeah, the, this is an adaptation that I feel like worked um, or bringing forward. And it's I, the, the podcast we did uh, came out this weekend, I think, on Watchmen. Ooh. Um, that one worked. 
that one worked because the original graphic novels were dealing with themes of like mutually assured destruction and, and making comics darker and edgier. And that sort of happened. And then 30 years later, uh, we get this series and it's dealing with the same sort of dark, edgy themes, things we don't like to look in the face or talk about that is in this contemporary moment. And it worked. That's a good one. Now, examples that I have that I know are going to be controversial of darker and edger being done poorly to primarily children's themed stuff would be Snyder's Batman versus Superman. The Snyder verse as a whole, really, in my opinion, I think it goes way too hard on the darker and edgy, edgier elements. I mean, I'm not against the idea of a deconstruction within a superhero film, but at the end of the day, if you're starting off your franchise this way with man of steel and then Batman versus Superman, this is a poor introduction to those ideas. I, I think of, yeah, Batman using a gun, uh, uh, Batman uh, murdering people on screen, no less. And his relationship with Clark is so damaged in these films. It doesn't feel like they're the same characters, in my opinion. I know there's a lot of people out there who love Snyderverse, and I'm not trying to say you're wrong. It's just I feel it's a very poor adaptation. And something else that comes to mind is Velma. I have not finished the show. I watched the first episode, and I checked out. And normally... I don't stop. Mama didn't raise no quitter, but <laughs> I quit for this one. And it was yeah. just awful. It's just the jokes didn't land. It was clear this is done for what's her name? Mindy, her Velma to be her OC, to have all these terrible things said about the Scooby-Doo characters and the canon. I was just not enjoying it. Do you guys have any examples you can think of? Yeah. Uh, not bad ones still, but on the other side of, Velma is Mystery Incorporated. An excellent one. Fantastic. Older, edgier, darker, great show. Still definitely, definably Scooby-Doo. And it was just so good. Yeah, it's like a perfect example of darker and edgier done right. And that if you you first show up with this, well, oh my gosh, what is this? They changed Scooby-Doo. But no, there's a story here. The characters are the same. They react in ways they would have. And it becomes something amazing along the way. James, do you have anything? Yeah, the, the only one I'm thinking of, and, and the reason I'm thinking of it is because a new book is releasing in this series um, is uh, <laughs> the Aragon movie that came out like mid-2000s. <laughs> There's a throwback, right? Like I yes. loved those as a kid. I don't care if they're derivative off of Tolkien or not. I love them. Yes. Uh, they were great. And that movie came out and it was like, whoa, wait a minute. Um, why would you produce this piece of garbage? <laughs> <laughs> the series was like still going. Like it's just so bad that like, it's going to deter people. Um, but a new book is coming out in that series. Um, so plug for that um, based on Murtag. But another one um, I'm thinking of is the last airbender mm. movie. Um, oh, yeah. You know there. Yeah, exactly. Visceral reactions there. And that that's a good one because it did try to make it a little bit darker, edgier, I thought, which was just um, out of out of step with the spirit of the show and just didn't work. Didn't work at a lot of levels, um, yes. but did not work. And I'm fear and trepidation for all of these uh, new Netflix adaptations that are going to come out. So let's hope they do well. All right, yes. Yeah, so like I said before, guys, I'm rating this a one out of ten. I've talked enough on my subject. Let's move on for TJ, your first subject. Hell's Paradise, the third of the dark trio, as they've come to be known. Um, it Chainsaw Man and Jujutsu Kaisen. Uh, Hell's Paradise is the only one that's finished, and it is now getting an anime adaptation. Uh, I don't know if y'all have seen the first episode, but pretty good. And I don't know if y'all have read the manga. But we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, but basically, if you haven't read it, you need to read it. Because I don't think you want to wait for the whole thing to be finished being animated. Maybe you're more patient than I am. <laughs> but uh, as soon as I heard that it was getting an anime adaptation, I read the whole manga. Because uh, I'm just not a fan of waiting. But Hell's Paradise is amazing. Stylistically, thematically... It's just, it's it's so good. It's so good. Basically, what you've got here, because I know it's not that popular yet, is <laughs> a criminal assassin, you know, of course, uh, gets offered a pardon by the Shogun if he can go to this island and retrieve the elixir of life. Him and a bunch of other criminals. 
uh, they, you know, they go and they get their handlers who are all part of the sect of uh, royal executioners, I guess, imperial execution executioners. Uh, they go to this island, and I really don't want to spoil it because it is new, but things go fairly poorly for most of them. And uh, maybe they find what they're looking for. But the growth we see in the series from each of the surviving characters is amazing. And they flesh these characters out so well. But definitely check it out if you haven't. And Christian, you said you did read the manga? Yes, I read the manga. And I did watch the first episode as well. I'm really hyped for this one. It's one of those, it's not going to be in my top, you know, 100 anytime soon but i really enjoy the the take on it and uh getting into some uh, buddhist and shinto uh beliefs of the afterlife and stuff like that i I was learning along the way and i really appreciated that i always like when something makes me learn and there are for the more squeamish among you there will be some body horror uh segments coming up soon it's body horror is my favorite part of horror i know a lot of people like it it's not for me to an extent, I can watch a little bit. I, I love The Thing. The Thing's one of my favorite movies of all time. But I have my limits, let's just say. So I'm looking forward to what they have to do, uh, have to say here. So, James, have you read it? I have not, but I've been I've been intrigued. I hadn't even really heard of it until maybe about a month ago um, when it started getting some hype for the anime coming out. So this is, this is interesting. I'm intrigued. Oh, it's good. It gets a little Cronenberg-esque for a solid you know, half of the manga, I feel like. Yeah. Uh, but ooh, it's so good. It's also, a, I think it's not as dark as Chainsaw Man or Jujutsu Kaisen. Okay. It feels a bit it's friendlier than those. Okay. It's it's interesting. We could probably do a whole separate conversation on why or how the developments within manga anime are going dark. Mm. Yeah. You know, you use the, the phrase dark trio. I hadn't heard that. Um, but it's interesting. We used to talk about the big three. Um, And even to an extent, like My Hero Academia, I don't know if you want to put that in the the big three. Some people do. Uh, (laughs) But uh, um, I love it. I'll ride it all the way down. But it's it's um, it ain't Naruto. Um, (laughs) Bit of a Um, difference. Right. So, yeah. But, you know, My Hero Academia, just season six just came out, which adapted the whole Dark Deku sort of storyline. And that went and is going super dark, too. So, um just interesting times that we're living in. Almost definitely. Mm-hmm. So, did you have anything else you want to add to this before we rate and review? Um, please watch Hell's Paradise if it is age appropriate for you. <laughs> well, well said. Yeah. Um, I'm going to give this this first episode a ten. I'll give the series as a whole like an eight. Mm, interesting. I'm I'm perfectly willing to give the series as a whole a nine. Um, it's it's really good. It's really solid. All right. Well, without any further ado, James, what is your first topic of discussion? My first topic of discussion is uh, the current state of the Pokemon trading card game. Um, so um, if do either of you follow Pokemon cards, open Pokemon cards, anything like that? We play Not Magic. Gen 1. Sorry, DJ. Not Gen 1. Magic. Magic? 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 Okay. <laughs> so um, I never went down the magic hole and... Uh, you know, when I uh, got my first job as a pastor was right around when COVID hit. And mm. I discovered that um, I was still a child in my heart yeah, and uh, never going to change. And also now I have adult money. And so one of the things I started to do again was um, get in to Pokemon cards. Um, so I really came um, in about halfway or returned um, from my childhood about halfway through the sword and shield era and now scarlet and violet is out and so there's a new generation of pokemon cards which just um released here in the u.s last friday march 31st so i've been opening some pokemon cards this week i've been hooked um but there are a lot of big changes that have come to um this set so the packs um the individual packs have gone up in price that's the first change so it used to be uh uh 
uh, three ninety nine. Now they are four fifty, and they have incorporated now some changes that um, align it more with the Japanese set. So the the iconic sort of yellow borders around Pokemon cards are now silver. So this is a big change. It probably saves the Pokemon Company printing costs since all the boards can now just be one base um, color internationally. Um, but the big change um, besides that is that um, there are now three guaranteed hollow cards in each pack. Wow. So previous packs would have a reverse hollow, um, which is sort of where the image itself isn't holographic, but the rest of the card is. This is a really bad example. This yellow one's a better example. You can sort of see the hollow on there. Um, but um, yeah, so now there are two reverse hollows in each pack and a guaranteed sort of foil holographic card um, in each. And from a, um, a thrill perspective, right? So um, you could go on, you could wait out the prices on sites like TCG Player and just buy the singles that you want. And I often do that when I have reached my limit of, I have now spent too much money opening Pokemon cards. Um, <laughs> and my fiance starts to look at me sideways and go, what are you doing? Um, um, now you get a hollow in each pack. Um, the pull rates are significantly, significantly higher um, than they seem to have been in the Sword and Shield generation. For instance, um, I opened two booster boxes on Friday. Um, each had 11 packs in them, and I got the equivalent of two secret art rare cards in those boxes. So basically one guaranteed in each box. Out of all of my opening packs in the Sword and Shield era, I never got a secret rare Um alternate art card so does this lessen the value of the cards yes does it increase the sort of thrill of the hunt of opening pokemon cards yes i think that's i think that's better i think that's better um you get people wanting to to sort of get back in the thrill of um not being crushed by pokemon cards you actually get something every once in a while that's like worth the the retail money that you spend um on the cards. So um, I think the change um, is good. Um, the last significant change is that the Pokemon V and V Max dynamic from Sword and Shield, which um, sort of paralleled the Dynamaxing and Gigantamaxing, is now returning um, or has now gone away in favor of a return to the Pokemon EX mm. dynamic which was first introduced in Ruby and Sapphire in 2003, went away for the last time in the X and Y um, generation of Pokemon cards. But now we're back. I was really disappointed um, leading up to it because the images I saw online um, weren't that thrilling compared to the V and V Max images. But having a couple of the EX cards now in hand, I am uh, very pleasantly surprised. Um, they're, they're able to do some things with the hollow foil that you just can't capture in images online. And so having them in hand, they look um, way, way better than I thought that they would. And yeah, the thrill of the hunt yeah. is back. I'm officially excited. I was, I was disappointed going into it and I've been very pleasantly surprised. So my rate and review of the new series is um, pretty high. I would, I would say it's an overall improvement. I would give it um, a sort of, probably like an eight or a nine um, out of 10. And part of the reason is that Pokemon has now gone all in with the, with the alternate art or illustration rare sort of concept. So realizing that cards aren't just for playability, but people want them for the art. Um, they're all in on that in this generation. And I think it's going to lead to good things. I think I'm going to have to go on Etsy and buy more custom frames. <laughs> Yeah, the Pokemon Company knows what they're doing as one of the most profitable franchises on the planet. I I think as someone who has no attachment to the cards right now, that's a very good system to get more people interested in buying them is to provide just enough of cool stuff to go, wait, there's still a chance I can find other things here. Yeah, I'm glad you brought this up. This is definitely some, a topic I never would have brought up, especially since I'm so far removed from it. But it's nice to get that insider scoop. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's really because it, it makes it feasible for you to, you know, when you're going to Target, just get a pack, get one pack. You might get something really good out of it because there's one in every box. Right, exactly. Yeah. So if you're not hooked, uh, 
beware. <laughs> you could get hooked. You could develop my problem. Yeah. It's like it's like gambling for kids. <laughs> and adults and, and, and for the for the kids at heart. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's All just right. kid friendly. So next up on our docket, we do have my second topic, which is Trigon Stampede, which is a reimagining and not a remake of the original Trigon anime, which uh, premiered in 98, if I remember correctly, thereabouts. This one is has had a ton of controversy around it regarding the CGI used in it, regarding the changes they've made to the story, even though they already said it was going to be a reimagining. Like, guys, have uh, have you seen the original anime and or read the manga? Yeah. I, I actually haven't for this one. This is one I never got into. Ooh, okay. TJ. I was just about to start reading the manga. It's on my list, which the manga list gets gone through much faster than every other list. Um, and I did watch the original anime. Yeah, I watched the original when I was in my junior year of college, uh, eons ago, when the world was young. And tremendously enjoyed it. It was a lot of good fun. It wasn't one of my favorites, but I definitely like when I was there, I had a good time. And to see this reimagining is something I've been looking forward to episode to episode. Like the hype just kept increasing. They've done a wondrous job with it and I'm in. And we may be getting a second season along the way because we definitely left on one of those, not exactly a cliffhanger, but like things to come kind of ending. So, like I said earlier, there was a lot of criticism brought against it for some of the changes it made, some of the like artistic choices they made. Like, is there anything inherently wrong with reimagining older stories, or should we leave them alone? We kind of brought this up earlier with the public domain thing, but like, this is a different way. No, I, I mean, I feel like it's fun. It gets cleared. Uh, a lot of stories deserve to be seen in slightly different ways, and if we have enough freedom to do that, then why not? I feel like. It, it can be a good thing if it gets a new base energized and into series, right? Even if we disagree with the sort of creative changes in the adaptation of a story, like now you have a base that like has watched this new thing, maybe loves it and misunder like wants to know why people are upset. So they go and watch the original and now you have compare and contrast, right? Yeah. Um, and now you have a whole new fan base. Yeah, I will say the people who dropped it early because of the changes they made dropped it a little too early because not to spoil anything, but certain things are going to still happen if you just stuck it out to the end, if you'd finished the race and run it well. Yeah, uh, I've only seen the first couple episodes of Stampede, but like we really enjoyed those couple episodes. We're just busy people, you know. Yeah. Yes, we've well, got some, you know, Apex to win. We're yeah. speaking of how that's going. Well, I just opened a hundred packs in the background um, while we were doing this. So it's going great. Um, the new split actually started yesterday. Uh, everyone's rank got set back two tiers. So instead of platinum, I'm now in silver and uh, we're just trying to get back to where we were and try to diamond this season. And we have 34 days. So, okay. Well, back to try again. That was your uh, apex minute. One of the points <laughs> Uh, brought up in the series is how we as humans kind of use energy to power the things around us. Like uh, what is everyone's personal thoughts on the current state of the various forms of energy used today and their byproducts? Uh -huh. Kind of an open, real open question there. Where to start? So I think uh, thorium based nuclear energy is the way to go. <laughs> um, thorium produces very little waste. It is much more efficient than uranium. Uh, it takes less to cool thorium. Uh, is much more efficient. Uh, it's like comparing uranium to coal, uh, thorium to uranium. And the reason we don't is because it doesn't create enough waste that we can use to create uh, depleted uranium rounds, um, nukes, you know, other <laughs> nuclear-based weapons. That was that was something. But yeah, that's what I think we should do. Other forms of energy are fine. Okay, James. Sorry about that notification that popped up in the background. It's okay. Um, yeah, that was that's an interesting lesson. I'm not surprised to learn that we don't use it because of uh, less valuable byproducts in the military industrial complex's eyes. Um, so for this, I think a lot about um, going to go hard, priest of the geeks here. I think a lot about Genesis, and one of the first commands that God gives is to to have dominion over the earth. 
And a lot of people confuse dominion with domination, right? Mm. Because humans have freedom and we have some degree of power. We can just do whatever we want. Um, and that like hardcore happened during the industrial revolution when we discovered that we can use coal and gasoline, um, oil to produce gasoline. Um, and it's easy, right? For the most part, you just burn that stuff and it creates so much energy and we don't think about the byproducts. And, you know, 150 years later, we're in this awful state of will our planet sort of survive? And we have this existential anxiety hanging over us. And there are some people who still just don't care. Um, so for me, it's a very theological, um, theologically motivated thing. Like we're called to take care of of this creation that we share, right? God has put us here to sort of for the benefit, for the caretaking of creation and the forms of energy that we use, I think should align with that. So like, yeah, if we can develop a nuclear energy source that is relatively clean and doesn't lead to nuclear weapons, like, yeah, we should go for that one. <laughs> yeah. The waste um, is also should... very inert. It, it does basically nothing. Oh. Yeah, I think both of you bring up some really good points here. Uh, I'm with TJ. I'm on the nuclear energy side, winning out in the end. Uh, less waste uh, produces a lot of power that we desperately need. As far as uh, renewable energies go, uh, wind power is only sustainable in certain areas of the world. Solar power, for the most part, could go anywhere. But the unfortunate consequence of that is all the rare metals we need that come in very war-torn regions of the world, especially Africa. And I'm not a fan of the human cost that comes from that. And the human greed that comes as, you know, that causes them to still be in harm's way. Uh, with, there's no such thing as a perfect energy. There's no such thing as a perpetual motion machine that we have created so far with science. That would break everything we know if that were to, to happen. So there's always going to be a byproduct. There's always going to be waste made. But I agree with James that we were created to watch over the earth. And part of that responsibility is making sure that the footprint we leave behind does not negatively affect it too much because re it's regardless it's going to happen everything's working towards entropy and we hasten that a little too much for our own good anything else guys pray for the planet pray for the Amen planet to that. <laughs> as far as rating and reviewing the show goes i i'm i'm between like a nine and a nine five and i'm only there because we have not finished everything that's there's still the hope for a new season so it could let me down later on so I'm going to stick there. I'm really enjoying it. So James, you have our next topic of discussion. Yeah. So I um, was struggling to find a second topic right now. And that's just because I'm in this holding period. Um, and because it's Lent and Holy Week and uh, work is a lot for me right now in the, in the pastor world. Um, so I'm going to look ahead a little bit and give some hype to some summer uh, releases of video games. So I've been waiting with braided breath. I'm letting my hands take a much needed uh, break and recover their stamina because um, it's a packed season. Um, I feel like this year in particular, the promises of the next generation games are now coming to fruition. I think we saw that, um, really kick off in February with Hogwarts Legacy. Um, and so coming up, we're going to start with April and go through probably um, July as the last, I think, big release go for, it. Um, for franchises. So um, this month coming out, um, finally, finally, Advanced Wars 1 and 2 uh, reboot camp, the remake of the original early 2000s games are going to come. Some classic strategy uh, games that were on the Game Boy Advance. Ironically, they were delayed um, several times. They were supposed to release um, in March and April of last year, so a full year earlier, delayed because of the war in Ukraine. Mm. Uh, there's a there's a bitter piece of irony there for me, but those are going to be great, um, and they're going to continue this trend of uh, remaking and reimagining all of our childhood um, classics. And I'm looking forward to it. I um, the the one remake that I uh, that they made this was probably 2020 was the remake of or the the remaster and collection of all of the Mega Man Zero 
games for the Game Boy Advance. Oh, I love those games. And I spent a whole month or two playing through every single one of them. Um, so I'm excited about Advance Wars. They're also doing um, a legacy collection from Mega Man Battle Network um, that comes out um, on the 14th of April. The big one for the end of this month um, that I am super pumped for is Star Wars Jedi Survivor. Yeah. That's coming out um, only on next gen consoles, however. So, um, luckily, every time I've been to GameStop in the last uh, month or two, we just have PS5s and Xbox Series Xs sitting. Um, so, I think the wait is finally over if you're ready to take the plunge into next gen um, gaming. I'm super excited for Jedi Survivor. I'm, I'm excited to see where the story goes. I'm excited they've teased in the trailer. Uh, that the main antagonist is perhaps a Jedi from the High Republic period who has been in stasis. So uh, that will, I think, just be an interesting way to, to get the fan base back into some of those stories. And they're doing a lot of fun things with novels um, and comics right now set in the High Republic. So, um, so Star, Wars, Star Wars Jedi Survivor, super pumped. Um, starting May, May 5th, uh, Hogwarts Legacy is finally making its way to the past gen of games, PlayStation 4 and Xbox One. It's also coming to the Switch um, in July if you want to explode your Nintendo Switch. <laughs> um, uh, that's going to show the dating of the Switch real quick, um, I think. It's an aging system. Um, the big one that will also probably push, push our Switches to the limit in May is the highly, highly anticipated a sequel to Breath of the Wild, Legend of Zelda, The Tears of the Kingdom. Um, if you've been following A.G. Aonuma, who is the producer for the Legend of Zelda games, did sort of a 10-minute um, gameplay trailer, um, I think a week or two ago now, and um, really showcased some of the mechanics of the game. We knew um, from trailers that the game was going to take on a new element of verticality um, with islands now floating in the sky that we can traverse. We had seen some mechanics, but really we've got um, several different um, powers or abilities that Link will gain, um, reveal the ability to fuse things together. Uh, one YouTuber I follow uh, is now calling this game The Legend of Zelda Nuts and Bolts. Um, <laughs> So how many things can we creatively put together with the new Fuse and Ultra Hand abilities? Um, we're going to have great fun, I'm sure, watching uh, YouTubers and speedrunners just completely break that game, um, as they did with the last one. Yeah, um, I'm excited to see where the story goes. I don't think um, it is a coincidence that, I guess, was this a year ago now? Um that they uh, remastered and ported Skyward Sword to the Switch. Um, I don't think that's a mistake. I would not be surprised if there were elements um, both from that game and from Twilight Princess um, that make their uh, uh, that pop up in the Tears of the Kingdom. It's going to be an interesting um, game. We still don't know a lot. We don't know if dungeons are going to return. That's been speculated. Um, we don't know um, much about the story. It's It's been highly, highly foreshadowed that Ganondorf that was sealed um, in Ocarina of Time and uh, dealt with again in Twilight Princess will make his return uh, to the game. So check those trailers out, get excited. Um, I'm taking time off of work that week. Uh, <laughs> that next week. Like, don't talk to me. I will be in my room playing on my new uh, pro controller that's going to release. So if you want to drop all of your money on uh, a new OLED switch, they've got it. They've got a new Amiibo. They've got the full gamut of things. Um, so that is, is the big one for me. June, um, lots of things coming out. Street Fighter Six. People are super hyped about Street Fighter VI, so if you're a fan of that franchise and series, get pumped for that. That's June 2nd. Um, and then me, my favorite uh, one that I'm looking forward to in June um, is Final Fantasy XVI. Mm. Um, Final Fa I'm, I'm, I'm preparing right now already just to have my heart broken again um, because we can't end a Final Fantasy series without some sort of tragedy. Like, don't get attached to the characters. Something awful is going to happen to them. Um, 
I've been uh, cautiously optimistic with some gameplay and some trailers that I've seen. I really loved Final Fantasy XV. Um, I thought it was a lot of fun. It wasn't a perfect game. Um, there are definitely things that they can do better, um, but it was um, exciting. So I'm excited to see what happens and how they make the next gen jump um, with Final Fantasy 16. That's June 22nd. Um, the last thing that I'm excited about is uh, July. This is sort of Nintendo's mid year um, franchise release is Pikmin 4. Um, will be coming out on July 21st. Um, so if you're a fan of that franchise, also get excited. I'm excited to throw some Pikmin and dig some things up and, and have some fun maybe along the way. So, um, so yeah, there are a ton of other things um, that are coming out this summer. It's a stacked next couple months. So if you're a gamer, uh, get excited for the games I mentioned and a lot more. Yeah. Dead Island 2 also comes out at the end of the month. Oh, yes. I did see that. I'm excited yeah. for that. I think out of all those, I'm the hypest for Jedi Survivor. <laughs> I'm ready to see what happened, what has happened since we last left Cal and the crew. And that being one of the few games that EA has made with their license, their exclusive license they had for so long that it did next to nothing good. Fallen Order was one of the best things they did. And I'm ready to see what they do now. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Now, I guess as a general sense, what is uh, your review, your rating and review of this whole thing? Like how hyped are you for what's going on? in the video gaming world, James. For summer 2023, I mean, I, I'm i I'm at a 9.5 to 10. I mean, I'm very excited. I think there's some huge releases coming out, some things that we've waited for a long time. I think this summer is where the promise of next-gen gaming, um, which I guess began almost three years ago now, I think it's where we're going to finally start to see it come into its own um, and flower. The consoles are available now for general public to purchase. Um, easily. Um, you don't have to sort of turn your Twitter notifications on and hope and pray that your hand is fast enough um, to purchase. And um, I think the games that we have been looking forward to and hope for are now finally starting to release in mass. We're sort of over the COVID uh, slump um, with things and finally getting back to business as usual. So it's, it's very exciting. Um, it's going to be uh, a lot of, a lot of hours this summer on my couch in my chair in front of the TV. That's right. All right. Good people. We've made you wait long enough. Yes. TJ's secret second thing is about to be revealed to us all. What could it be? Please, TJ, leave us in awe of your majesty in this moment. Long lauded as one of the greatest horror games of all time. A game that may be on more consoles than any other, except for Skyrim. A game that changed the path of its own series and kind of changed, honestly, I think changed a generation in a way. Uh, Resident Evil 4 remake has released and it is fantastic. It is amazing. It's so good. Uh, but before we talk about it a little bit more, uh, how do you guys feel about the way that, you know, movies and games have been recently where it's just like, oh, uh, we can just remake this thing. I, mean, I think as far as video game remakes are concerned, bringing them for a new audience is something I'm always in favor of because, I mean, there are people, they're not going to go back and play the original because that's a lot of time and money to put into something instead of what is currently out and about. So I'm all for that if it's good. And I was never a Resident Evil guy. So I got to say my hype level kind of decreased a bit with your news. But you know what? You're really hyped about it. So I'm happy for you. So go ahead, James. Do you have any idea? Anything you want to say? Yeah, I, I, so I'm torn. Um, some of the remakes, remasters are awesome. Um, and I love them. And it's fun to delve back into those stories and those worlds and um, that gameplay experience. Um, when I can finally get my, the, the one that I'm uh, pumped about personally that I haven't gotten my hands on yet because I am still a physical copy game person is the Metroid Prime remaster um heard the music from metroid prime and i was instantly transported to like being 12 years old on my like 12 inch tv in my room just like terrified um <laughs> of what's about to pop the next corner um so i so yeah so it, it's a fun way to go back and 
and and be in those worlds. What what I don't like about it um, is that sometimes our uh, fever for nostalgia uh, stifles our movement forward, right? So like, what's Resident Evil up to now in terms of numbers? Will the uh, next one be six? The next one will be nine. Next one will be nine. So I'm not a huge into that series, um, as you can tell. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, why not Resident Evil Nine? Um, you know, when's that? When's that coming? Doesn't matter. Doesn't need. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. <laughs> Doesn't matter. So Resident Evil. That is what matters. Um, I think. I yeah. I do think I remember four uh, being huge when it came out. Um, so yeah. So I I love it. Um, and sometimes I wonder uh, why aren't we going forward? Are we are we going back too much? Yeah. I th- actually, I think next is eight. Next is eight because Village just came out and Village was seven. Yeah, yeah. Village was okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. But uh, honestly, uh, I do. I believe, and I'm not alone in this, that Resident Evil Four was the best one, and then it took a severe slump for two games. Wait, no, the next one is nine. Two games because five and six came out. Then Biohazard was better, and then Village was really good. So the next one's nine, and five and six are both really bad. Resident Evil 4, it, I think, is the perfect installation in the series. If you've never played Resident Evil 4, or yeah, Resident Evil 4, really, because it changed a lot between 3 and 4. But Resident Evil 4 is goofy, campy. Resident Evil loves its camp. Uh, it's still an engaging enough story. Uh, people have their gripes with it, but I, I still think it, it's very compelling. And this remake is perfect. It's gorgeous. It's mechanically more sound. It's less janky. Uh, I feel like they've ticked the difficulty up a little bit. And some of the puzzles I feel are easier. That may be because I was a child. (laughs) So who knows? But some of those puzzles used to be real hard, real tough. Yeah. Uh, they've kind of they haven't bloated the game with extra things. Uh, they've just taken it, updated it, uh, took out some parts of the game or took out some parts of maps that people thought were obnoxious. Switch things around so you don't know exactly what's going to happen, and it it does more than enough to make you think, okay, this is different. This is worth playing. Because, man, is it worth playing. I've been having an absolute ball uh, whenever I can get a chance to play it without, you know, my friends saying, hey, let's get on Apex. (laughs) But hands down, for sure worth it. If you're ever only ever going to buy one remake, I'd say save that for when Knights of the Old Republic remake comes out. That's right. But if you're going to buy two, you should get Knights of the Old Republic 1 and 2. But if you get three, get Resident Evil 4. Yeah. Also... Uh, Christian, you gotta get into Resident Evil. What's the issue there? I have watched playthroughs of one through three of the remakes. Yeah, one, one, two, and three have had remakes, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's not for me. Uh, when it comes to this, I'm a huge scaredy cat playing horror video games. I can watch a movie, no problem. But then when I'm in control, forget about it. It's like, nope, I can't handle this madness. I can't to an extent in other areas if it's not like the focus of the game, but nope, nope. It uh, yeah. doesn't matter how bright the room is. doesn't matter, you know, all the cheery friends I could have by my side encouraging me through it. Can't do it. Not for me. You got to try four. four. Four really changes things a lot. It becomes more of an action game than a horror game. It, it strikes, I think this strikes the happy medium. Resi 5 was too actiony, and Resi 6 was pretty much the same, but with extra characters. Okay. Do you have anything else you want to add to this, TJ? Yeah, 9.5 out of 10. Okay. Nice. Yep. Yeah, I'm not a fan of this se- Well, I'm not, it's not that I'm not a fan. I've never really got delved into the series, but I just Googled uh, Resident Evil 4 because I was, I was trying to remember if the, the main character was the one I was thinking of. Yeah. Very, this game originally came out in 2005, so very like My Chemical Romance hairstyle. Um <laughs> I'm going to take that for you all. Um, and uh, I remember this game being so huge that, like, it's probably one of those, oh, yeah, you're doing it, TJ. I got oh, you, yeah. yeah. Um, oh, oh, you've got you. Now now we're cosplaying. Uh, um, yeah, it's a shame this is an audio-only medium. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Um, 
I feel like I remember this game being so huge that like every once in a while a game is so good, right? That it deserves, I feel like the remaster for a new generation. Yeah. This is sure. probably one of those cases. Absolutely. Uh, it's, it was my favorite game for a long time. It was the best game I'd ever played for maybe a year. I think I played Knights of the Old Republic like the next year, but what a game, what a remake. Um, do whatever you got to do to experience Resident Evil 4 remake. Uh, if you can't play it, watch it. Uh, if you have a PS5 and don't want to buy it, uh, hit me up. You can sign into my account. Uh, you know, it's also on PS4, so uh, check it out. I'm extremely yeah, generous. Go for people who can't afford the game. Whoever can see a man of people. That he is. Always looking out for him. All right. Well, unless there's anything you guys would like to bring up about anything we did before, let's head to our conclusion. Uh, shoot the like if you're going to play Resident Evil 4. It's a good I did time. see that Easter egg. You get some free loot. Big help. All right. So, guys, which of the topics today was your top recommendation? I feel like my top recommendation was just this upcoming summer of games um, to get hyped for. Uh, summer 2023 is going to be peak. So, uh, get hype, look forward, save some money, do what you got to do. Resident Evil 4. I'm going to go with Hell's Paradise. And I think it's something that people a lot you need to get into. If you can handle some of the uh, things that can happen in it, you're golden. It's a really good series. Go check it out. I'm glad TJ brought it up for our discussion. So, guys, yeah. thank you once again for listening to this What's News uh, segment. What's new? What's news? I keep changing up the name all the time. Go ahead and visit us at our website at systematicecology.org. You can find a lot of the tabs there for the hosts and the episodes we've been on, as well as our guest segment uh, section to see people who've guested with us before. You can also suggest future episode topics there too, to say, hey, I really want you to discuss XYZ series. Chances are we'll have someone who knows what it is and we'll get it done. Guys, also join our Discord. We're having a lot of good conversations there about the stuff we're watching, the stuff we're reading, so on and so forth. Join our, excuse me, subscribe to our YouTube page where we've had a lot of really good discussions on various series ranging from horror to comic books and so on and so forth please consider joining our patreon as well we really need your help there to continue to pay for our website hosting for uh, to bring things to our patrons as well that we really enjoy working with them with and remember we are all a chosen people a geekdom of priests This was an Anazal Ministries podcast. If you enjoyed this show and would like to learn more about our network, be sure to check out the Anazal Ministries podcast network.